Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast, a complex trauma podcast through the NARM Training Institute. My name is Sarah Buino, and I'm so excited to be sharing today's interview with you. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. The NARM Training Institute has a very special announcement. We are offering the Level 2 NARM Therapist Training online for the very first time. For anyone who may have been waiting for NARM training to come to your city or country, the wait is over. You can join us online starting in January 2021 for this NARM therapist training for mental health professionals working with complex trauma. This online training is an exciting opportunity to receive advanced, specialized training in addressing attachment, relational, developmental, and cultural and intergenerational trauma. For more information and to register, please visit www.narmtraining.com slash level two online. We look forward to you joining our growing international NARM community and are inspired to work with you to bring NARM to your clients and communities in order to transform trauma. And now for our interview with today's guest, Iris McAlpin. Iris is a NARM practitioner and coach specializing in eating disorder recovery, complex trauma, and self-sabotage. She has both a private practice and group practice and works with clients all over the world. Iris also has a podcast called Pure Curiosity, which seeks to facilitate nuanced conversations about the human experience and to destigmatize mental health challenges. So please enjoy my conversation with Iris. Hello, Iris. Welcome to Transforming Trauma. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. This is very exciting. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you because you have a podcast called Your Curiosity and you had Brad as a guest and I listened to that episode and, and really enjoyed your style. So we're just going to have an amazing conversation. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. So first, tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Iris McAlpin. I'm a coach. I work primarily with eating disorder recovery and now, thanks to NARM, do a lot of work with complex trauma and self-sabotage. And I work with people privately. I have a group program called Bloom that's really specifically geared toward self-sabotage. And trauma is pretty much my all-consuming passion. And so any opportunity to, to talk about it, I'm always very excited about. Wonderful. And like we start a NARM session asking what people want for themselves, we ask our, our guests here, what do you want listeners to get out of our conversation today? Hmm. I love that question. Well, it's funny. I sort of notice, thanks to NARM training, I've developed a much better ability to notice when I'm putting pressure on myself. And so sort of noticing some some pressure to be like funny or insightful or something which is great. I can track that. And so I think in the spirit of that, I would love for listeners to be able to soften around any pressure they're putting on themselves, maybe around how they should be coping with the pandemic or how they should be showing up in their life in one way or another. So that would be, I think, a welcome intention at this point in time. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that you name that you've recognized the pressure you put on yourself after training through NARM. That's one of the biggest takeaways for me as well. And what a what a painful realization that has been. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's been I've been so excited about it because it's a sneaky one. And I'm sort of a world class navel gazer in some ways, for better or worse. But having that awareness really has changed my life pretty meaningfully because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it was just flying right under the radar. And, and so having that clarified has given me a lot of room to be able to name it, which is very helpful. And then also to be able to work with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what led you to the NARM training? Great question. It's sort of a serendipitous thing. So I, I've been really talking a lot about complex trauma and in terms of its relationship to eating disorders and self-sabotage for about four years now, just in my programs. And I was having to pull from all these disparate areas of thought and really just from a lot of my own sort of intense introspection, putting these pieces together. And my mom knew that I was really interested in all this kind of stuff. And so she saw healing developmental trauma, I think on a bookshelf somewhere, maybe at Spirit Rock, <laughs> I think. 
And she sent it to me. And at the time I was sort of full up, you know, I, I didn't really have time to read it, but it was just always sitting on my shelf, staring at me. I was like, eventually I'm going to pick up this book and it's going to be good. And when I did it, it was truthfully one of the most validating experiences of my life because it had sort of synthesized a lot of these things that I had been thinking about and talking about, but just on this level that was so elevated, it gave me a framework for thinking not only about my clients, but about myself. That was just the depth of that was, was really powerful for me. And so I immediately felt like I need to find out more about this. Like I want, like, give it to me. I need more. And so I looked it up online and realized there was a training 10 minutes from where I lived at the no time. No way. Yeah. It was Come one of those. On now, universe. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those faded moments where I just, I knew that it was something I needed to do. And so, you know, I've been sort of working on my own for a really long time and just having real role models to look up to in the community of NARM and all of that has just been so enriching. So I'm right. grateful for it. Yeah, I keep joking. And now I'm even more serious with the pandemic that we should have a NARM commune. <laughs> I think we should. I want to escape oh the world God. and just be with people who are truly doing their work and, <laughs> and the way that they hold trauma and NARM with the disconnection from self and others. It's just, yeah, it kind of just put puzzle pieces together for me. Absolutely. And I love what you said about people that are doing their own work. And that's something that really struck me. So I, I've been to a lot of clinical trainings over the years, even as a coach, just wanting to learn as much as I can. And that's been sorely missing from a lot of the trainings, like not only finding people that are deeply engaged in their own work, but even a discussion around that in the training. And so the emphasis on that for me was one of the things that really solidified my love for an arm because it's just I think it's one of the most important things we can do absolutely yeah well let's dig into the actual work that you do so you mentioned eating disorders and self-sabotage so mm -hmm. I'd love to hear how complex trauma I mean I can imagine how they go together but how does complex trauma influence work with that population great question so there are a lot of ways that I could begin that I'll just sort of start with, you know, when I first really started diving into recovery for myself, I was sort of like, quote unquote, in recovery for a long time, but really fighting against it. And as I sort of was starting to deal with the more behavioral aspects more effectively, I started realizing that there was a lot mm -hmm. more going on. And just through my own exploration, started realizing that there was a lot of this that had to do with relational trauma. I didn't even necessarily know what to call that at that right. point, but I became very interested in that and started searching through the literature, trying to find people talking about this and stumbled across somatic experiencing and started learning more about that and just how trauma disconnects us from our bodies. And then once we're disconnected from our bodies, we're also disconnected from our, our feelings and so these things sort of started to click for me. And I was working with clients at that time, not even necessarily specifically looking for clients that were in recovery, but just because I was very open about my experiences with bulimia, people started coming to me wanting to get help with that. And this consistent pattern, childhood trauma, I'm disconnected from my body. These were like the two most universal things that... I was noticing. So of course that piqued my curiosity further, started learning more about that. And then also the role of diet culture in the formation of eating disorders, which is also traumatic and how being thin creates not only a lot of pressure, but then if we're not thin, it threatens our attachment relationships. So there's a lot of, I could get into there if, if we want to, but I think through my understanding of this and just sort of piecing these things together with my clients, I started to shift my emphasis more toward trauma. Even now, I, I do end up working with a lot of people with eating disorders, but really what's at the core of the work that I'm doing now is NARM because I find I was having a lot of success with clients before this, but it's even more powerful and I think faster in some ways now because it really just gets to the core of the issue. The eating disorders, like many other 
behaviors that we could sort of throw under the umbrella of self-sabotage are really just coping tools. And so a lot of times it's just used. It's, it can be temporarily a very effective way to manage some of the dysregulation and you know intense feelings that come up as a result of complex trauma. Right. And from the norm perspective, you know, I I remember in the training hearing, we're not focused on behaviors, we're focused on the underlying things. And and for especially a disorder with eating, that's huge, because I work mostly in addiction, and people can stop using drugs and alcohol and live their lives. But we, we know with work with eating disorders, you cannot stop eating and live your life. So there's so much that's tied into that. And you mentioned you didn't say these words exactly, but in my head, I heard, you know, the trauma of diet culture. And I actually think that would be really important to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I love talking about this. So something that people commonly misunderstand about eating disorders, one, a lot of people think eating disorders, they think anorexia, but it's actually the least common eating disorder. No, I did not know that. Yeah. Binge eating disorder is by far the most common eating disorder, bulimia second, anorexia third which is also sort of a reflection of our culture's fascination and idealization of thinness. Can that just sit for a minute? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Oof. I felt that in my core. It's something that I get pretty activated about sometimes Mm. because a lot of the coverage in the media around eating disorders is usually about anorexia. And it leaves a lot of people with marginalized bodies feeling very left out of that conversation. Thankfully, that's starting to shift. But for many years, you never heard about I mean, binge eating disorder is even a recent diagnosis. And so clients who come in who you see as being harmed by the the trauma of diet culture, like what are they presenting with? Self-loathing, self-hatred, deep body shame, and food fixation, you know, where food becomes the primary content of all of their waking thoughts and and body image as well. And the thing that I think is really important to talk about is that a lot of times people hear eating disorders, they think it has something to do with vanity, like personal vanity. And because we live in a culture with a lot of thin privilege and a lot of fat phobia, it has nothing to do with vanity or maybe, maybe a tiny bit, but really it has to do with belonging. And so if your body doesn't fit what you deem to be like a normatively attractive or socially acceptable body, then that poses a real threat in terms of your position within your community, potentially. Hopefully that's not really the case and you have a community around you that is supportive, but some people don't have that, certainly. And even ones that do sometimes don't perceive it that way. And even if you have maybe a community around you that's accepting it, the larger community doesn't. And so there's thin privilege, thin and pretty privilege, right? So if people have that, they are more apt to get what they want in the world. It's true. Yeah, there's no denying that. And it's it's a real problem. And something that you know has been really beautiful, but also somewhat problematic is the body positive movement. And I blundered my way into this initially as well, where I hated my body for many, many years, had an extremely antagonistic relationship with food and myself sort of generally. And so when I heard about body positivity, I was very excited and wanted to kind of join that movement. It was very empowering for me personally, but then the deeper into it I got, the more I realized this is not for me. This is for marginalized bodies. This is for people of color. This is for people that don't benefit from white privilege, from thin privilege that have been silenced in this conversation around eating disorders for so long. And at first it was a little triggering for me, to be honest, because it's like, what are you talking about? Like I I had an eating disorder forever. Like, of course this applies to me, but then I've, through having a lot of really interesting conversations with a lot of women of different backgrounds and sizes, a lot of women who don't fit the BMI for someone with an eating disorder are just not believed by their doctors or even applauded for exhibiting eating disorder behavior, which is extremely traumatic. If you go in and you're starving yourself and over-exercising, but for genetic reasons or, you know, microbiome reasons or whatever is going on with your body, you're presenting as what society would deem overweight, your doctor will maybe congratulate you for the behaviors that you're exhibiting. That would be diagnostic criteria for anorexia and somebody who's underweight. 
So that's a, a huge social justice issue where the health at every size movement was born from that I think is important that people know about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm thinking when you were talking about the body positive movement, I'm thinking of Instagram handles like Shuglet. Is that oh, how I you... Don't... Oh, you don't, I don't know Shuglet? I don't. I think that's how you pronounce it. I hope I'm saying it right, but I don't even know who the owner of the account is. This is a terrible representation of it, but <laughs> it's, it's S-H-O-O-G-L-E-T, and they take pictures of people who would be considered morbidly obese by medical yeah. standards, and there are these just really beautiful photos of quote unquote, not flattering angles of one's yes. bodies. But I mean, these photos are just absolutely breathtaking. And a friend of mine who she was ha actually having a photo shoot and she's like, yeah, it's kind of like Shuglet like. And I'm like, what? And she's like, here, follow this Instagram <laughs> handle. And it's so helpful for me because just thinking about my own relationship to my body and how shame and, and trauma is involved with that. You know, I watched my mom diet my whole life and I will never forget she had this sweatshirt that a neighbor who had a crush on her got her this sweatshirt and it said, I'm not fat, I'm fluffy. <laughs> and her like her reconciling with recognizing that other people notice how she talked about her own body. Right. And then how that was then <laughs> transmitted to me, her daughter watching this and what we think is beautiful. It's so white, cis, thin, pretty privileged. Right. For sure. Yeah, I'm actually really happy I haven't heard of that handle because it tells me that there's such a large world mm -hmm. of body positivity that's happening that I'm not. I used to be very aware of all of the accounts that were out there. And now I haven't heard of a lot of them. And I, I see that as a good sign <laughs> that this is proliferating and that people are are waking up to this. And I think about movements like that, too. And this is not necessarily for this handle, but in some instances, I find that the body positivity is not necessarily an authentic love of self, but it's essentially born out of trying to be the opposite of what yes. hurt them. Can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah. It's a, Well, it's a really natural human thing, I think, to want to try to overcompensate in some way for a place where we feel raw or tender, like there's a void there. And I think something that is emerging that I'm very happy about is a more emphasis on body neutrality, which I think is really rooted from a deeper place of self-love. It's like, I don't need to love my physical body to be able to love my, my life and to be able to go out and do the things that really matter to me. And just this idea that we don't really care about how our body looks in, in relationship to our ability to, to do the things that we care mm. about. I applaud people who are wanting to embody this body positive movement, even without fully believing it. I think sometimes it's kind of that Amy Cuddy, like fake it till you become it kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I don't think that automatically happens. I think that happens if we're also integrating some personal work in that process, but it can be a really important step. And there's something about letting yourself be seen in your like perceived flaws that can be deeply healing for people. And so if you're taking a bikini shot and posting it on social media, even though you might get subjected to pretty horrific trolling, which happens a lot, there's still something about reclaiming your space and that even if it hasn't fully internalized that I think can, it can be a, a lot for people. And I, I've seen that happen for some people where it can be quite triggering and kind of precipitate a, like a contraction of sorts, but that can also be healing in the long term as well. Sort of that back and forth. Absolutely. Cause we talk about disconnection being an important part of the process. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I'm curious if you have any examples of, of stories of either struggle or success that you'd be willing to share with listeners. Sure. Just in terms of working, working with, with clients. NARM. In NARM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. What's been really cool about working with NARM with clients. So in my current program, it's not eating disorder specific, but again, people tend to come in with these issues and I, partially maybe because of me and partially because these are just incredibly common. But what's been kind of cool about using NARM is that 
the eating conversations somewhat quickly fade into the background and it really becomes more about a relationship to self and exploring how these often subtle traumas, I have some clients who have decidedly non-subtle traumas, but I have clients who it's just, you know, the little remark from their mom every now and again. And the fact that, you know, certain foods were banned from the house or these little paper cuts over time that are really difficult to parse out. It's not like I had this car accident that I remember. It's like, this is just your lived experience, which is why complex trauma is so complex, I think. So the conversation shifts very quickly into exploring where these beliefs that tend to show up everywhere in their life. Like if you're a very black and white thinker around food and body image, that tends to permeate everything. And so that often becomes a vehicle for exploring other areas of their lives. And I think it just makes things move more quickly. And also it goes much deeper. And so it's been cool because like in the last program I had, for example, I had a couple people who, even though that wasn't necessarily the focus of some of our sessions together, their eating behaviors just organically improved and their levels of self-compassion organically improved. So it, it doesn't always have to be at the fore of the conversation. And I think there's actually something to that, especially this was very true for me, pretty strong autonomy dynamics that I've worked with. And anytime I was sort of trying to do a frontal assault on the eating disorder, like trying to really focus on that and dismantle that, that was kind of a trap for me. And so it was sort of working around it, working on other areas of my life and examining those attitudes and beliefs and behaviors that were showing up there. That felt safer, but then there was a ripple effect that ended up happening. Yeah. And for listeners who haven't been part of the NARM training or maybe haven't read Larry's book yet, can you describe how you understand the autonomy survival style? Sure. I identify highly with that as well. <laughs> yeah. So with autonomy, hopefully I will do this justice, but often stems from an inability to authentically express ourselves in our family systems, whether it's like a rigid authoritarian parent with the sort of my way or the highway kind of thing or chronically getting in trouble. But there is some belief that de develops through that process that like who I am naturally and my, my natural ways of showing up in the world are not acceptable. And so as a result of that, there's this outward compliance, this like, okay, I'll show up the way you want me to show up, but there's going to be an inner rebellion and sometimes anger that we have about that, that might normally be expressed outwardly, that would be potentially threatening gets turned inward. And so there's a lot of pressuring of the self. There's a lot of negative self-talk. There's a lot of efforting and rebelliousness, even not only rebelling against perceived authority, but also rebelling against our own internal goals and agendas, which is part of the formation of a lot of self-sabotage behaviors. And you gave me the perfect segue. That's exactly what I wanted to hear about next was yeah. more of your work with folks who have self-sabotage. And is that only in the realm of food or is that just any self-sabotage? Yeah. I mean, the program deals with things like procrastination, which is also a lovely feature of autonomy and the negative self-talk, which is something people don't always conceptualize as self-sabotage, but I definitely consider it as such. And toxic relationship dynamics, like pursuing, consistently pursuing partners that are good for you or, you know, always wanting the person who's not available, those kinds of things. Fear of success that shows up a lot or like intense fear of failure that results in analysis paralysis or just paralysis of action in general. These are the kinds of things that I work on with my clients. And really at the core of my work that NARM has really helped me clarify is understanding the, the utility of these behaviors and that they are, at least from a certain lens, really smart. Maybe not so much for ourselves in, in current time as adults, but they don't develop out of thin air and there there is a good reason and there's some hidden logic that's present. So a lot of my work is around 
sniffing out some of the logic behind our self-sabotage behaviors. And ultimately, I think when we sort of understand this is an intelligent adaptation, there's some room for self-compassion in that. And so that's a pretty beautiful process to watch people coming around to that. Yeah. I'm also thinking, I don't know if you experienced this, but at least as a therapist, we have people who come to our practice and who are like, okay, I have X problem and I want it to be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that there's an overlap with the eating disorder community and perfectionism. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that's even probably more pronounced with people who come to you. So can you walk us through, you know, a, a person calls you up and says, hey, Iris, I binge on smart food popcorn. Consequently, that is what I've been binging on lately. <laughs> um, Pretty good. <laughs> like I, I come in and I binge on this thing and I yeah. want that behavior gone. How do you start inviting that exploration with people? It's so different in every mm -hmm. situation because it, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on, I usually ask them how they found me and why they're calling me specifically because I do a lot of public speaking either through my podcast or various channels and then through my work on Instagram and writing and all of this. So if, if someone's called me, there's usually a baseline understanding that we're not just going to be dealing with the behaviors. It does happen. It definitely happens. And from there, my natural orientation that NARM beautifully supports is just bringing a lot of curiosity to it and asking them, okay, like if you were able to to change this behavior, what is it that you think would provide for you? And from there, depending on what they say, there may not be much content to work with there. There could be something very rich to work with there and just continuing to be curious. And then also at a certain point, you know, if this was a consultation call or something, I would tell them like, Hey, you know, if, if you really just want a behavioral approach, I'm not your girl, <laughs> you know? And there's a lot of intuitive eating coaches I could point you toward. And that's great if that's what you want to pursue. If you want to go deeper, if you want to explore the roots of this and see where this might be coming from for you, then I'm fully on board for that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I appreciate so much about the norm approach in that too, is that we can just be really honest with people and be like, that's not what I do. Yeah. You're coming to me for CBT? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I've got a list of people I can point you toward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or I'll go get one if needed. But I, I think it's important to be really honest about that, not only for them, but just for myself. You know, I don't particularly want to spend my time on making behavioral tweaks with people. I, I find it much more enriching to go to the core of it. Right. If you could wave a magic wand and fix all of eating disorder treatment in this country, <laughs> what would you like to see changed? Oh, wow. I'm giving you so much power. Yeah, that would be nice. I mean, I think bringing NARM into it would be a dream just to have that available for everyone. And of course, you know, this is my opinion. I just think it's more powerful than anything else being done in this mm -hmm. arena. And I also think guided use of psychedelic medicine mm -hmm. would be extremely, extremely impactful. Of course, with the right people and with proper supervision and, you know, screening for predispositions toward mental health conditions that can be problematic and all of that. But I do think it's an incredible tool for facilitating, reconnecting the mind and the body, feeling safe enough to go back into the body. And so that can be a beautiful tool. And I think we're already starting to see more somatic awareness being taught in general. And I think I would like to see that continue. But thankfully, I think that is starting to happen already. Yeah. I also think too, our medical system probably has to change before the treatment centers can truly change. Because if we're relying on insurance to pay, for a certain thing where you're supposed to be using quote unquote evidence-based models. And I, I continue to try to remind my students and, and when I do speaking gigs that evidence-based essentially means that it's reproducible 
And NARM, as we know, because it's so personal and so individual, it's not easily reproducible, like the same thing over and over, even though, you know, like you said, you're seeing quicker results working with your clients with this methodology. So one of my hopes for change in this country post COVID is that we really take a look at our healthcare system and, and how it's actually keeping people sick, keeping people stuck in the symptoms instead of looking at the root. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a huge problem. And I think in the eating disorder community in particular, we sort of spoke to this already, but a lot of people don't match the diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder that have an eating disorder. And that's a huge barrier for treatment if you don't just have gobs of money to spend on treatment. It is easier if you're underweight to get diagnosed and get treatment, but most people with eating disorders don't look like they have eating disorders. And so that's something that's really going to have to change to make even basic treatment more widely available. Yeah, that's a really powerful quote. Most people with eating disorders don't look like they have eating disorders. Yes. Yeah. That's the truth. I never yeah. did. It just makes me think of when I teach like addiction 101 to my students, a lot of the times the feedback I get is, oh, I didn't know anybody could be an addict. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't, you're not just a bum on the street. So it's this, this is similar, not just super overweight people or super skinny people are the ones who have eating disorders. Yes. Yeah. And similarly with addiction, they're very highly functioning people. I mean, a lot of celebrities, performers at the top of their field. Mm -hmm. Whenever I see somebody having to lose or gain a bunch of weight for a role, I'm always like, oh, what is, how is that? Like, that doesn't seem okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's unfortunately setting that person up for potentially yeah. a lifetime of complications around their relationship with food if they didn't already mm -hmm. have one. Right. So it's, it, I always cringe a little bit when I see that. For some mm. reason, it seems this is very much changing and I have more and more male clients that comes to me presenting with some eating disorder behavior. But I think because at least historically, there hasn't been quite as much pressure on men to fit a certain mold appearance wise, they can go through a lot of jockeys, you know, do very intense dieting and are able to kind of come out of that unscathed. But I think with women, when we're not only messing with our biology and physiology, when we're also sort of being expected to conform in this particular way, that adds this extra layer of shame and, and complication that has made it much easier for women to develop eating disorders. Yeah, I think it was the book I was reading. I think it was Selfie. And the book is essentially about how our culture has become more narcissistic. And he was saying in that book that men now thanks to Instagram, really are being pressured more to have this, this body image. And I mean, the pressure to be jacked, right? Yes. You know, all these things that we're seeing on Facebook and Instagram. So I, yeah, I'd be curious in 10, 20 years, what treatment is going to look like specifically for men in terms of eating disorders. I'm curious to see that too. I mean, obviously, what we'd like to see is fewer women experiencing it and even fewer men, but the direction it's going, it's almost every woman has at least some challenge in her relationship with food and body image. And now an increasingly large percentage of men are, are facing the same. And my biggest hope, I think, in all of this and why I'm always so excited to talk about trauma is my hope is that as the trauma-informed movement builds some steam, that there will be a turning point in which some of these numbers start to go the other direction. I mean, I don't know how much of that is wishful thinking or how much of that is possible, but I'm mm -hmm. going to keep operating as though it's possible because that will keep me moving forward. Right. Yeah. I wonder that too, because I feel like it's the American way to think of time as being linear and progress being linear and okay, sure. we're going to get here. And we're even susceptible to that too, of like, okay, progress will look like a decrease in this, which is such a linear response instead of, I've been reading this book that's talking about everything being a cycle of seasons. Mm -hmm. And right now we're in a crisis. Shocker. <laughs> yeah. And this, not this, not the pandemic was predicted, but essentially a crisis of our culture because we've been so linear and focused on success. And if that's not a cultural trauma, I don't know what is. Absolutely. Yeah. Something that's been helpful to me in addition to NARM, you know, over the last seven years, I've become a pretty serious student of the I Ching. I don't know that. 
Tell me more. Ah, it's an ancient Chinese text rooted in Taoist philosophy. Okay. But it talks a lot about nonlinearity of progress mm, mm-hmm. and that there's always these hidden paths that we're not able to see until much later. And so it may look like we're veering wildly off course, but it may mm-hmm. be that that's required yep. for a course correction. Right. There has to be death before we can have rebirth. Exactly. Yeah. So that that orientation toward life has helped me, I think, with NAR. It's also helped me with just dealing with something like this. It's It seems really horrible right now. And obviously, we don't know how this is going to go. There's also the potential for this to be something that really moves us toward collective healing. And I'm just crossing all my I fingers know. and toes and hoping right? that happens. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Well, in all the time that you've worked with complex trauma, is there anything that sticks out to you and you're learning from your clients that's really helped you and that you would want to share with other folks? Mm-hmm. Kind of a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. Something that really sticks out to me about working with complex trauma that I think it's good to talk about it may not be the sexiest thing to talk about, but that it's really scary. And I talk about that because I think it's important for people to know it causes us to do what I believe is a really important thing as a human, but it's to really like deconstruct our identity and brings us to ask questions about the fundamental essence of who we are. And that's not a small task. And it's not a task that I think can ever be fully completed. But there's something really, I find extraordinarily beautiful about that process. And what I notice with my clients is, is they come in, and they're afraid. And we bring curiosity to that as well, (laughs) bring curiosity to everything. And as you know, we sit with that together, there's this surrender that can take place, maybe not immediately, maybe it takes quite a bit of time, but there's this opening, there's this, this expansion that happens in that. And it's magic, in a way. Yeah. And so I think some of that has really helped me as I bump up against triggers, which I do all the time, every day. I really see those triggers as an invitation to open. And that's sort of something that I learned from my clients, watching them wrestle with this. And I'm I'm continuously inspired by the work that my clients do and just how willing they are, how vulnerable they are and how unique and beautiful they all are. You know, I really fall in love with everyone I work with. And, you know, I say this a lot and some people may hear it as like a canned response, but it's just, it is such an honor for me to work with people. Yeah. I I never used to believe that when my therapist would say that until I became a therapist. And then I was like, oh yeah, 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 that's true. I get it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you put that also beautifully. I feel like one of the, one of the underpinnings of NARM, they don't quite say it this way, but I feel like in NARM, nothing is wrong. It's all in service of something. And sometimes, you know, the survival styles that we're engaging in are not working. Doesn't mean that they're wrong or bad, but we can just invite curiosity, take a look at them and potentially make other choices. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something that I love being consistently reminded about because I think it's Mm -hmm. so easy to go into that default setting of there's something wrong here. If it feels Mm -hmm. like something's wrong, it's very easy to have that thought. Right. (laughs) And so I love that orientation because it it is all for the learning. It's all information. So even some of the the most challenging sensations and emotions can provide a deep well of information for us. And so I always welcome that. Yeah, I've yet to had personally a healing experience that didn't involve going through some pain. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part, you know, and I, I have a couple clients in particular that just want me to take away their pain. And I'm like, that's, again, that's not what I do. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, it's, it's very true. And I do think that deeply 
joyful experiences can also be quite healing. Even then, though, especially when or I can just speak for myself, some of those experiences for me have at least been peppered with some pain just of the grief of Mm -hmm. recognizing where I maybe previously haven't let myself experience that level of joy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been just such a a lovely conversation. Do you want to tell folks a little bit more about your podcast and, and where they can find you and connect with you? Sure. Yeah. My podcast is called Pure Curiosity and you can find it on iTunes and Spotify and all the places you find your podcasts. And I do quite a bit of posting on Instagram about various things, usually complex trauma or body image related. And my handle is just at Iris McAlpin and I have all my links and everything there. So that's usually a good place to find me. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And I look forward to a friendship with you now. Likewise. Thank you, Sarah. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. If you want to learn more, you can check out the show notes or visit us at www.narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. The NARM Training Institute has a very special announcement. We are offering the Level 2 NARM Therapist Training online for the very first time. The trauma field is evolving so quickly. Trauma-informed therapists who want to learn how to address the long-term impacts of adverse childhood experiences and complex post-traumatic stress disorder want to be trained in NARM, one of the first clinical models specifically designed to address ACEs and CPTSD. This online NARM therapist training is starting in January 2021 and is filling up fast. So if you're interested, we'd encourage you to register now to reserve your spot. Please visit www.narmtraining.com slash level two online. That's www.narmtraining.com slash L-E-V-E-L, the number two, O-N-L-I-N-E. Thanks to Andrea Clunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We really look forward to building community and connection with you and changing the world by transforming trauma. 